Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the live stream. I'm excited to be back with you guys today. I'm going to be doing live streams, I think, now on a weekly basis, although I'm looking for some feedback if this is a good time, because now that I'm doing cross-platform, I've got some statistics showing that this is a really good time for certain platforms, maybe not some others. So let's get into it and get started with the stream. So a couple of things I want to address today. Um, this is an ask me anything. It's about anything medical coding, anything related to the industry. I do not provide information about personal stuff, my social security number, my personal finances, my address. I cannot do uh, consulting services during the AMA because it would be very boring watching me look things up in the federal register. I also don't provide denials resolution. Um, I can possibly direct you to some people, but if you have a specific denial for something in your region, you know, I'm, I'm probably gonna offer some generic advice like call the insurance company and ask them about why the service was denied. Um, and actual coding scenarios, you know, I don't think it would be very interesting to watch me sit here and actually code things on my book. But anything in regards to job seeking, information that you need to know about stuff that's going medical coding wise, if you need to find CEUs, I have lots of great tips on that. Let's say hello to a few people in the chat room today. So Natasha, good afternoon. It is afternoon here in the East Coast. It actually is 12.01 where I'm at. Hello, Natasha. <clears throat> hey, Demetrius, good to see you here. Good morning to Kamala Bird. It's good to see you here too. Carla, Jocelyn, we got here in the house today. Lillian Green, thank you. You're always showing up for me, Lillian Green. It's good to see you here today. I saw some questions come through already in the chat this morning. Any tips for coders with no experience trying to find a job? So actually job seeking and updated job seeking was the topic of the uploaded video that I have on my YouTube channel today. So go on there, there is a great new updated video and it's not just about how people have found jobs in the past, it's really what you can do today in this kind of environment, in our pandemic environment, to help find medical coding jobs. And I walk you through a little bit of websites that you can utilize. Uh, there's even a tracker that I linked to where you can track because I don't want anyone wasting their time and submitting to the same job multiple times because I know sometimes when you're looking for a job, you tend to apply to everything and you can't remember if this is a new posting, an old posting, if you've posted it uh, before or if you've not. <clears throat> So I just have a little simple spreadsheet, what the company name is, what the job title is when you submitted for it so that you can see, oh, maybe I haven't submitted to this job in three months. Maybe this is something I should resubmit to or call or inquire about. So yeah, uh, definitely great information there. It was actually sponsored by Harmony Healthcare and Harmony Healthcare, you can connect with them here on LinkedIn. They do have uh, coding professionals that they are hiring as well. So. I also want to do today, I am going to do the drawing. I don't know if some, all of you know, I just hit 15,000 subscribers, almost at 16,000 now. I grow at about two and a half thousand a month. And I had a giveaway to celebrate that. So I'm put together this medical coding mystery pack. It is so cute. I found all kinds of neat little medical coding themed stuff to put into it. And I don't want to show you everything that's in it, but like, for example, one of the things that I got was I purchased the uh, e &M Quick check guide from the AMA. So that's one of the items that's gonna be in the medical coding mystery pack is the, uh, the, the these used to be so much smaller. Look how big, this is like an accordion. This is the uh, AMA's little pocket guide to evaluation and management coding. It's basically the same stuff that's in your CPT book on the sections on e &M coding, but it's in this handy little accordion pocket guide. So that's going to be in the medical coding mystery pack. I'm actually going to draw for that right now. I'm going to do it off screen because I don't want it. I don't remember what all displays when I hit select the person. And I want to make sure that it doesn't have someone's like, you know, personal address or anything on there. But let's go over ready to award. So I have on here that this was. <clears throat> do, 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 do. So the person who's going to be getting this is a brewer 11, a brewer 11, six at gmail.com. So that is the person that will be receiving the prize 
So I'm going to email that person and they're going to get a medical coding mystery pack. If they don't respond in the next three days, I will pick someone else. So I had over a hundred contestants for that. And that was a really great contest. So I have some cool stuff I'm going to be sending out to that person. I'll be sending them a personal email to request it. Hello, Louisa. Good to see you here. How are things in Maryland? So let's get on to some more questions. But yeah, if you're looking for a job, definitely check out that new video that I posted today where I give you some different resources on how you can find a job. Casey Huffman says, I am taking an online course to get my certificate for medical coding. However, will this be sufficient for me to test with the AAPC or will I need to get an associate to better prepare me for the field? That is a great question. So confession time, I'm going to tell you guys, I actually don't even have an associate's degree. When I got into medical coding, they didn't really have a lot of associate's degree programs. So I just have a certificate from my community college, like a career program that they had at the time. Um, and it was great, great training, but not quite enough to get me ready for the CPC exam. So I did have a course through a um, AAPC approved instructor that they came to my organization at the time and said, hey, you know, we're going to pay, my organization said, we're going to pay for whoever wants to get certified as a coder because we need some certified coders. If you take this course through this lady, you pay her X amount of dollars and you pass it and get your CPC will reimburse you. So I think depending on how elaborate the courses that you're taking at your community college or whatever training, what I would do is the best way I think to evaluate your readiness is to do practice examinations. So if you want to purchase a practice examination through the AAPC and see how you do there, or I have a, a review course that comes with a practice examination on my website as well. You can check those out. And if you're doing okay, if you're at like an 80%, that means you're probably ready. There are also review courses that are available through your local chapter. Sometimes local chapters will host them for uh, sometimes free, depending on the chapter. Sometimes they're very reasonable, you know, $25, $30. A lot of them are doing them now via Zoom. So you can connect with your local chapter and find review courses as well. And if you're doing that review course and you think, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about this, do the practice exam, you're feeling pretty good about this, then you probably don't need any other training. If you're, you're still struggling, then you might need something a little bit more in depth. Um, I know there's even organizations out there like CCO has a blitz program, which is kind of in between like a full course and a review course. So that might be something to even look in as, as well. Hey, Faye Wynn, good to see you here. Other questions I've got. Trailer Ready to Code says, hey, Victoria, what's the best way to train myself to distinguish the main term versus the modifier? So I'm going to assume that you're talking about like ICD-10 CM codes. And I actually published a short video about one of the concepts that you can think of first is, you know, anything that is more almost adjective wise or describing that situation. So for example, the word foot pain, if you look under the word foot, it's going to tell you C condition because it wants you to look under not the word condition in the alphabetic index, but what is the condition of that foot? Is it itchy? Is it red? Is it painful? Is it throbbing? Is it amputated? That's the term that you should be looking at for your main term. So don't look at things like body areas or organ systems, kind of look for more something that might be a description of that actual problem, the burning, throbbing, radiating, itching. Um, if it's an encounter, if it is a fall, those type of words versus maybe a location or area. I've decided to focus on looking for E&M jobs. This helps me focus when I'm looking for jobs, but also which things to practice while I'm looking. Is this a realistic strategy or am I missing something? So that is a great question as well. I used to love E&M coding. And if you can get into a good groove with evaluation and management, that is fantastic because there's always, always, always going to be a need in the industry for people who can just go through E&Ms and do, you know, 15 to 20 E&M cases, depending on what kind of specialty and the, the depth of the note in an hour. 
I think right now there's probably going to be a lot of need for evaluation and management coders because of those changes we just went through in the office and outpatient guidelines. You know, I think uh, as we're getting now into <clears throat> almost month three of the, these new guidelines, we're starting to get enough data that companies are probably going to start looking at doing some audits uh, going back the past month or two, kind of seeing what was, what's been going on. And providers, healthcare organizations, they know that day is coming. They know that they're going to take a look at those office and they want to be compliant. So I think e &M right now is very hot. Um, I would certainly not exclusively look for e &M jobs. It's always good to niche down, but having a, a broad general knowledge is very helpful as well. Um, because if you can't specifically find an E&M job or maybe something really good comes your way in dermatology, um, you know, you definitely want to have at least a basic knowledge to get in the door there. Jocelyn says, I tried applying for jobs that will lead to medical coding. I just accepted an offer with CVS. It's a remote position <clears throat> dealing with billing and coding. And I don't have any experience and I'm still in school. That's fantastic. You know, anything you can do to get your foot in the door. And that sounds like it was a great opportunity. CVS is a good company to work for. So really congratulations on being able to um, find that job. And there are, there are organizations that sometimes will hire brand new coders that are still in school and not certified because that particular position they need maybe isn't as in depth enough to, to require a certified coder, but they may make it contingent. Uh, I've seen positions that they'll say, Hey, you know, we'll hire you, but in your first year, we want you to get your CPC or we want you to get your CCS. And they'll make that a requirement of that position. But um, sometimes they do have positions that they're just like, hey, you know what, we want someone who kind of knows something about coding, but isn't going to be actively coding, and they can get that information. <clears throat> Law says, any CPPM advice? I know a handful of people that have taken that CPPM exam. You know, I, I understand that the study guide is very important. I always, with AAPC exams, say go onto the AAPC website, and I'll see if I can find it. I don't know. I don't want to show myself logged in. I'll make sure I want to log out first so no one sees my member ID number. Not that I know what they would do with it, but I know some people are very funny about their member ID number. So let's get over here. If you go to any of these certifications, so where's our CPPM? CPPM's over here. I always check to see if there's any additional information to prepare for the exam, because sometimes they'll put websites and things on there that they really want you to look at. It looks like the CPPM, I'm not seeing anything. So in that case, I would really just make sure that you're doing well on your practice exams, make sure that you have the study guide, because it says here that that's highly recommended. And see how you're doing on those practice exams. Um, from what I understand, unless this has changed since the last time I proctored it, you're allowed like a pencil and a calculator and that's it. And it's just a lot of question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. It's not like some of the coding and billing exams where you need your books and you're going to be looking things up. It's just Q and A, you know it or you don't type of stuff. Thoughts on automation and coding, man. I'm I'm starting to feel a little bit like a uh, like a parrot when it, with this one. I get this question uh, quite a bit cu from curious parties lately, and some people I appreciate that it was asked in a very polite fashion because I've noticed I'm getting uh, some commentary where it's just like coding is going to be eliminated in the next few years because of automation. You should see all the AI that's going out. So this is my thought process on coding and AI. I've worked with AI and coding for as long as I've been a coder. There's always been encoders. There's always been EMRs that help you select codes, pick codes. I worked with a provider that um, very much wanted this coding automated through a program in the EMR. I believe we call, refer to it as the wizard. I don't think that's actually what it was called, but we called it the wizard. And we kind of put it up to, to snuff. We said, we're going to see how this works. We're going to let the providers use this prompt, this wizard and see how their coding is. And then we're gonna review it based off of our coder knowledge of the guidelines. And there was, oh my gosh, you know, a very um, noticeable difference that, you know, while it did help sometimes with the prompts that it was not always accurately coding based off of the coding guidelines. 
I'll also say that there's things out there like QuickBooks. I used QuickBooks when I was starting out my business. Um, it has a lot of automation in it. It can automatically pull in information from my banking accounts, sort them, file them. I pay for an accountant now though. And the reason I pay for an accountant now though is because the risk that's involved with my not doing something correctly with my business, with my not filing something correctly, is incredibly high. So even though there is automation and I could just have QuickBooks file all of my stuff and put my taxes together, I really want that person. I want that accountant. I want that bookkeeper who has that knowledge. Um, there's AI that can write books and there's Grammarly. So AI could write a book. We could use Grammarly to fix up everything in it. But I have yet to see an AI that's on the number one bestseller list for the New York Times. So when we get to that part where AI is writing number one bestseller books and can do all of my bookkeeping and I feel that I can take them to court and defend me in an audit if something is wrong with my taxes, then I'll start worrying about automation and medical coding. But at this point, you know, there's there's always going to need be a need for medical coders, even if it's in more of a auditing or a quality assurance role. I could see maybe a transition to that. There might need to be a decrease of certified coders for certain tasks and a shift of focus elsewhere, but it will not be eliminated due to the use of AI. This one I love. So Emily's saying, any tips for getting over the initial learning curve? I am having imposter syndrome. So my best thing I can tell you is that I still have that. There are days where I look at things and I go, oh my gosh, I am the worst coder in the world. I don't know anything that I'm doing. I'm sure there's people out there who think that about me every day. I don't know anything that I'm doing. My whole life has been a scam because clearly because I can't answer this cardiovascular question, I just don't, I just don't know anything about coding and I've just been a fraud this entire time. My friend Tony L. Holmes actually did a great podcast episode. I think it was the week before last. Check out, go on Google, check out Alpha Coding Experts podcast. I'll actually should bring it up here. Alpha Coding Experts. So this is my buddy Tony's website. You can go right on here on her podcast and she has an episode on here that is specifically about imposter syndrome. Um, and a lot of coders that I've talked to, oh, oh, no, is it loading? Is it loading? Is it loading? Oh, here we go. It's my wonky website. So you can get the information here from her website about the Alpha Coding Experts podcast. It's also on Spotify and uh, iTunes. So Google that. And she has a great, she's a great po podcast specifically for imposter syndrome. It's something I deal with as well. Uh, you know, as coders, we, we always are aiming for accuracy because we think we just, you know, we found the right code, we did it right. And when we find out we messed something up, it's like, oh, it's like a dagger to the heart every single time. And that's just part of being a coder. That is absolutely part of being, congratulations to Hari! Hari just passed his CPC exam with a, with a 78%. That's fantastic. I love that. Love that. Love that. Love that. Congratulations to you. Chikina, I passed my CPC exam in December. Congratulations, Chikina. Passed, uh, passed the exam in December. I'm looking for a job. In the meantime, until I find a job, I am studying the guidelines and medical terms. Is there anything else I could be studying or doing? My suggestion would be if you have not yet, uh, if you're still an apprentice coder, make sure that you get your apprentice status removed. If you have the experience and you can submit that, do that. If not, look into doing the Practicode program because that will help remove some of those experience requirements if you're an apprentice coder. Um, check out the video that I just published today on tips for finding a medical coding job. I saw my buddy Marissa pop in. Hi, Marissa, I see you out there. Always happy to see Marissa in here. She's so wonderful. How long should I be timing myself on the AAPC practice test? I don't know where I heard 115 minutes. Just wanna make sure I am ready for the actual exam. So let's see here. The exam in person is five hours and 40 minutes. I believe it is five hours, 30 minutes for the online exam because of the not having breaks with the online exam. So there's like that 10 minute difference between online or in person. So let's see, five hours and 40 minutes times five plus 40. 
So the total time for the exam in minutes for in-person would be 340 minutes. If we divide that, if you're doing a practice exam, for example, that is 50 questions, you would need to do it in 100, about 113 minutes for 50 for 50 questions. So if you're just segmenting out 50 questions, do it within 113 minutes or so. And that way you, you're, you'll be in the good time range that you can finish on time. Paula. Paula just took her CPC exam two days ago and she's still tired, hope I passed. You know what, when I took my CPC exam, I did it at Hershey Medical Center in their big auditorium that they have. It's like a big, uh, it's a huge academic institution. And I was at the auditorium and my head was down like this for so long. I swear I had like a kink in my neck for two or three days. I should have, you know, in hindsight, scheduled some sort of neck and shoulder massage the day of my exam, but it's, it, I'm about two hours out from Hershey. So my drive back from Hershey and back then, I think I had like a Garmin GPS or something that I was trying to use to help me find my way back. Um, and was panicking because during some of the roads, it, it like kicked out and then was picking back up. And I am not, I am not a, an adventurous person when it comes to traveling. So that was absolutely freaking me out. Um, so yeah, I think I went home and slept for the remainder of the, the day after that. I'm going to be taking the CBCS exam. Do you have any tips? So that one I haven't taken myself, the, the Certified Billing and Coding Specialist exam. I think that's what, through the NHA. That one I don't have any specific tips on. I've not taken it myself, but if anyone in the chat has tips that they can ride specifically on that, because I'm not even familiar enough to know if that's like a multiple choice or not. I feel like it is. I feel like it's only a HEMA that doesn't have the multiple choice ones for some reason. Eden's asking, hi, do you recommend the AAPC programs or outside coding schools? I was just wondering if it's worth the cost, especially because I have a bachelor's in accounting to fall back on. It really depends on your learning style to some degree. Uh, I know people who have done fantastic with the AAPC programs. I know people who have gotten gone through them and also gone, you know, I just, I need an instructor. I just, I need an instructor that they thought they could do it on demand and, you know, soon were in over their head because it just wasn't the learning format for them. It certainly is for others, but it just wasn't for them. Um, so that's something to weigh because the AAPC does offer programs where it's on demand fully or where they have a live instructor. So um, depending on your learning style, if you feel that you can understand this fairly well on your own, go with the on demand with the AAPC. If there's other organizations where you are that you're familiar with that you trust more, there's a lot of independent, there's a ton of independent instructors out there that you can go with. Um, so if there's someone who maybe offers something that you can take for free, see their learning style, and you really like that learning style, feel free to just take a, a, progr a program with that instructor. You know, if you want someone that you can meet with weekly, that might be more of a, a better way to go. Yeah, Marissa saying she took the CBCS and it's multiple choice and it's pretty easy if you went through school and did well there. Okay, cool. Ah, Mallory is here and she says, good afternoon, everyone. I'm taking my CPC exam on March 8th. That's exciting. That's like what, less than two weeks now. That's fantastic. Mallory, let us know. Are you taking it in person or are you going online? Uh, let's see here. Um, oh, this is a great question. Sandy's asking, are the new e &M codes on the CPC exam? So they're not necessarily new. Well, there are a couple of new codes, maybe the add-on codes for Medicare, the G codes or might be new. But the new guidelines for the office now patient ones, they are on the CPC exam likely. 
Um, it's it's kind of hard to say specifically what is and is not going to be on the exam because of the fact that it's 150 questions out of you know a bajillion different codes. Um, they have updated the exam for 2021, which means that those new guidelines that were implemented on January 1st would be reflected in the CPC exam if you have a question on those specific E&M codes. My thought is they're probably going to throw a couple in there. So you do want to make sure that you're familiar with the new office outpatient guidelines for codes 99201 through 99215. Because I, I'm going to, I'm going to fully fess up. I predicted that they were just going to say to pick the level of number of complexity of problems addressed, amount of complexity of data and risk, but it looks more like now they're actually going to make you score it out. So let me actually bring this up on my document camera real quick so I can kind of show you. So when you're scoring for the 99201 through the 99215s now, I was under the impression thinking that because they used to just give you the history exam medical decision making, I thought they would just say, oh yeah, it was an office outpatient visit and it had uh, moderate risk, moderate complexity of problems, you know, moderate number, you know, et cetera. And you would just pick the level four because it was moderate, moderate, moderate. But now it looks more like they are actually going to have you more so code out and score out the E&M level versus just saying it was, you know, moderate and low and moderate. So I would definitely make sure, I think the AMA website, if I remember correctly, does have some, some basic training that you can go through on those guidelines that changed on January 1. Paul is asking, Victoria, is there a way to have a job utilizing coding knowledge, like filing or typing documents without being an actual coder? Yeah. So if you go onto um, my channel, I have a job. Um, I think I have a video that's called Alternate Jobs for Medical Coders. And on that, you can find some information about different jobs that you can qualify for that aren't necessarily coding jobs, but you can use some of your coding skills. And let me just switch over here real quick. If if you're on like the main page for my channel and you're just starting out, I actually have a new playlist that I just started up two days ago. That's specifically for people who are just getting started, like a whole playlist of like, I'm interested in medical coding and I don't know what to do. So if you know anyone that's interested, you can send them to this whole wanna be a medical coder start here playlist. And that has all the information, but specifically when we're talking about what ones are related to jobs, let's see here. Jobs. Job, job, where is it? I'm losing my mind over here. It is probably went right past it. How to become a medical coder, case studies, holiday games. Practice questions. I don't know why I can't find it. You guys are probably all screaming at me right now going, it's right there, Victoria. I don't know why I can't seem to find it right now. But there is a, I swear there is a video on here that's alternative jobs for medical coders. Case study, please. How to become a medical coder, medical coded salary. Maybe it was an older video than I thought. Let's see if it just comes up in search. Jobs for medical coders. There it is, job options for medical coders. Took me forever to find it, oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> um, Tina Davis says, this is so cool, I've never caught a live before. Hey, great to have you here. Ah, oh, Marissa, thanks for the super chat. 
Marissa with in, coming in with a $2 super chat. Good luck to everyone in their CPC exams. Yeah, it sounds like we've got a lot of people coming up that are coming with their, their exams on the CPC. Why did that not pop up? I thought I had an alert box for super chats. Where is my alert box? Maybe it's showing on YouTube, but not on my stream. <laughs> Mary Ellen's asking, are there practice questions somewhere specifically for the new EM? Um, I don't know that of any that are specifically just for the evaluation and management section, but um, I think the practice exam I have has like two questions on it. I'll have to think about that. I don't know that there's anything that's specifically for just the new EM questions. I think it's just a lot of just general 2021. Check though on the AMA website, because like I said, they have a lot of resources directly on the AMA website. Oh, Emily's saying that my, my playlist of guidelines is helping me you so much. Thank you. I think sometimes, and honestly, I, I think sometimes it's just helpful to have someone kind of talk you through them just a little bit. Although I wish I could re redo some of the intro. I did have some comments and I, I really took them to heart because I think there was some commentary where you know, at the beginning of the playlist, I'm like, you know, I've been getting a lot of requests to go through all of the guidelines and it's a huge order and, you know, medical coding, blah, blah, blah. And I, I, a couple of people commented that that was kind of like scolding and negative. And when I rewatched it, I'm like, you know, I kind of, I can see where they're coming from. And I'm kind of debating if I want to like go back and edit that part out or maybe re-record one of it. And I know one of them, part of it got cut off. So maybe over the years, I'll, I'll kind of go back and, and edit it a little bit to, to get it out of there. <laughs> Melissa says, yeah, I'm on live. Thank you, for, uh, Melissa. I really appreciate your commentary. That's so great. Tina saying, I should receive my CPC guide tomorrow, taking practice exams this month. You are super, super helpful. Yeah. So that's, those are my two big things is really is is taking those practice like reading your guidelines rereading your guidelines and taking the practice exams because you want to make sure that not only are you coding accurately but you're going to do it in a fashion that you can finish the exam on time um and feel free you know some people have different methods some people i personally love to skip around i advise others to skip around but some people are like i am so afraid that if i skip a question that i'll forget to come back or if you're filling in the little grids where you have to mark in the bubbles in person, they're afraid that they'll misalign them. And I, I think I've done that not wholly with the entire exam before, but I was taking one of my coding credentials and, you know, it's like, oh, I'm going to skip this question and then forgot to move on to the next line to bubble. And I had like three or four down before I was like, wait a second, wait a second. I'm not at the right, I'm not at the right number here. <laughs> apparently I botched your name pronunciation. I'm so, 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 so sorry. Um, I'm not, I'm certainly not the best with that. Cassie's saying, I, she really hopes that I do more videos on the sample questions and walking through each ones. Yeah. You know, this is, this is the barrier I'm facing with the sample questions. So, I'm an AAPC approved instructor. I have materials that I get for the AAPC for teaching classes. It's, it's, oh, I got it right. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, but those materials are really supposed to be for teaching classes, not for me to just show you all of the materials on my monetized YouTube channel. So when it comes to the case scenarios, you know, I can't just take all of their materials because they're not mine. I didn't make them and publish them on my site to go through and walk through. I also can't just take you know, like the step-by-step -step study guide, because that's copyrighted. And so he can say, hey, let me show you all the stuff in this copyrighted book. It would be like if I was just going to go, hey, I'm just going to air a few minutes of Star Wars on my channel today, and that should totally be fine. I'm sure Lucasfilms and Disney will be okay with it. Um, you know, it might skate by for a little while, but there might potentially be a day of reckoning. And that's where we kind of get into, uh, get into Harry Waters is because even with the CPT book, it's copyrighted. So I can say, hey, here's a little sample. Here's how I look something up. You know, if I'm walking you through the entire book and showing you the entire thing, you know, that's a little bit different. Um, same thing with the case examples. So there's sites out there like empty samples where I can pull stuff and they're like, hey, you can use this, 
for their like medical transcription sample notes. You can use this, um, just source back to us, which is what I do. And I say, hey, thanks for this. And this is how I coded it out, et cetera, et cetera. And it's a little bit different. Um, so that's a little bit different. I thought about at one point saying, you know, hey, I'll start like a Dropbox and send me some notes and we can use them. But the problem with that is we as coders don't own the notes, the physicians do. So it's really not within the rights of the coder to take physicians notes, omit all the personal information and patient information and just send them over to me so I can profit off of them on my monetized channel. Um, so I'm trying to think of some alternative ways that I could potentially compliantly and within regulations get some cases and demonstrate them um, on a monetized YouTube channel, you know, and, and work within those copyright regulations. So that might have to involve me going directly possibly to physicians or providers for notes. I feel like I should say, <laughs> this is terrible. I shouldn't even say this. There has to be some way I can like uh, uh, solicit like med students or something and residents who don't have a lot of money and be like, hey, if you give me some notes, I'll, you know, I'll PayPal you 20 bucks. <laughs> That's terrible. Um, I have you comment in here from Melissa who says I'm an LPN and went back to school for coding. I finished in May. You are helpful to get through all of my online school. Thank you so much. Well, that's great, Melissa. I've gotten a lot of, uh, feedback from LPNs, uh, some RNs, some, you know, um, others in similar nursing type of roles that are really interested now in getting into medical coding, which I think is fantastic. I'm actually going to start working with a nursing agency. Uh, our nursing, I guess, not agency, but um, online presence. Uh, I have to send them some videos actually today because I'm going to be working with them to kind of be their resident medical coding spokesperson to their coding pop their coding their nursing population that's interested in medical coding. Ted is saying, have those AAPC instructor worksheets been updated yet? I'm not quite sure exactly which instructor worksheets you're speaking of. You could just kind of let me know if it's uh, the worksheets for instructors like that they give on the Blackboard page, or if you're talking about uh, something that you've gotten from your instructor. Someone's asking, can you do a video on how important it really is to understand medical terminology and anatomy? You know, that's not a bad idea. And I can add that onto my list. My list is like a million pages long right now. Excuse me for a second. I just, oh, my nose really itches. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I think, I think that would be a good idea because there are a lot of people that I've encountered that have some sort of misconception that in medical coding, you don't really need to know medical terminology and anatomy because all it is is like looking things up, almost like you're just pulling out a phone book and looking up someone's number. And we all know that that's not quite what medical coding is. Um, so yeah, I think that's a, it would be great to kind of demonstrate some things. I've spoken to it a little bit in certain videos where I've kind of gone, oh, well, if you think medical coding is just, you know, you look up the code, here's a cute little example where we're just, oh yeah, we're looking up this and this is what it is. Here's a five page operative report. Tell me exactly how you look that up. So that might be something, uh, to kind of, kind of demonstrate. I do get a lot of questions about things like, well, when I'm coding, I can just, you know, if I don't understand a term, I can just look it up in Google. Well, yeah, you can. Uh, it's not going to help you on the passing the certification exam because for the CPC exam, you're not allowed a medical dictionary or any kind of look. Um, but I think it might be good to do some demonstrations and really kind of show you, yes, this isn't like looking up something in the phone book. It really is knowing the guidelines, understanding how to apply them, knowing, you know, uh, you know, I can't, you can't speak to a provider if you can't speak the lingo. I passed the CPC exam in December. Now the test is changing. What advice do you have for those taking the test in 2021? Um, if you're saying you passed the CPC exam in December, then you're going to have to refresh on the updates so you can get there's different webinars even that the AAPC offers, ICD-10 and CPT updates webinar. So that will give you the new information. Um, but if you're talking about if you studied in 2020 and now you're testing in 2021, which I, I know a handful of people are, 
Um, if you studied in 2020 and you need to know the 2021 information, kind of the same thing. You can go onto the AAPC website and get the updated code information. Or you can even do, if you're in, for example, your CPT book, because, you know, I think like there were some, some changes on ICD 10 CM, but what you can do is in your CPT book, if you're, because you're going to want to test with a new book, there's an appendices in the back here that will show you all of the updated codes. So that is a good spot to review if you're looking for all of the new updates. So right here is where on your appendix B in CPT is where the uh, information is on the summary of additions, deletions, and revisions. So that gives you all of the information that you'll need on the updated codes from the prior year. So you could even just go over that and maybe do like an ICD-10 CM updates. Or uh, if you have, there's certain programs that if you have like an encoder or a codify, they'll sometimes give you little cheat sheets. I shouldn't say cheat sheets. Everyone's gotten hot about that lately. Reference sheets about the code updates. So you can go on some of those and they'll give you a listing of all the different codes that have opened. Does the AAPC have anything new in the works to support local chapters? I think they do. I, you know, health cons usually when a lot of big new announcements come out. So my assumption would be that a lot of the newsy stuff that's going to happen is going to happen during the, uh, the health con. I know, um, and I'll speak just a, a second as someone on the board of directors, because I, I kind of don't on my channel, but um, I believe we are working towards... Um, giving leniency as allowed with right now with the local chapters, you know, typically we have four in persons a year, or you have to have two virtual meetings. And we understand that there's, you know, right now, a lot of chapters that are having trouble finding exam locations or in-person meetings aren't allowed. So, you know, while we want you to do everything you can to continue uh, things as normally as it allows, you know, we also understand that in some cases, particularly places like California, where things are very hot right now, it, it's not particularly going to happen that year. But I think there's probably going to be some good announcements that will come out of HealthCon. I have some quick study, trifolded laminated sheets that are review biology, anatomy, midterm diagnoses, and CPT coding. Do you think these are worth going over? Are you familiar? I've seen a couple. I, I have seen them. I have personally like touched a few like uh, for anatomy and the AMA express check sheet. Um, I think they're definitely worth going over, you know, maybe saying I'm going to spend 20 minutes right now, set a timer, go over this biology one, go over this anatomy one. So I think they are our great resources. Bye, Marissa, have fun at work. Antonia says, hello, I went to school and got my certificate for billing and coding. What's the next step? So the next step is to become a certified coder. So there's a difference between the certificate that you get from school I wish I had a third camera in here. Wait, hold on. <laughs> I don't have the third camera on in here. Okay. Um, but there's some great certifications you can get through AAPC or AHIMA. So you can kind of see one of mine. Hold on right here. If I do uh, and then go up and over. There I go. So there... <laughs> There's one of my coding certifications from the AAPC, but that's not what I got from my school. I got a totally different certificate from my school, just saying that I'm a medical billing and insurance specialist. So the next step would definitely be to look into uh, AAPC or AHIMA to get a coding certification through them, either the CPC, CCS, CCSP, whatever. I always say, you know, nothing against any other organization that has coding certifications, but AAPC and AHIMA are like Coke and Pepsi. So those are the brands everyone's familiar with. Those are the ones that employers are going to look for because they know that they're the brand names are the ones that they can trust. Um, you know, nothing against anyone else, but when you're competing against Coke and Pepsi, and then all of a sudden you've got, you know, Dr. Pibb over here, it's like, okay, well, I don't know how I feel about Dr. Pibb. I know about Coke and Pepsi and those are good. So we're just looking for those two. So that would be the next step. 
if I've scheduled a CPC exam and find one closer at an earlier date, will I be able to reschedule? And how would you go about that? Definitely call the AAPC and ask because sometimes if it's uh, very soon, they might not be able to switch it. But in a lot of cases, they do. They would allow you to switch. Um, you know, it, it really depends on what they are going to allow. Another tip I want to give while we're kind of on the subject of exams is you can purchase vouchers for exams if you can't find an area near you, but you want to make sure that you have paid for it already. So for example, in December, I think it was, there was like a Black Friday sale on uh, if you were already credentialed and wanted to get a secondary credential. And I thought, oh, well, while they're, you know, half price, I'll sign up to get my CPB. So and since they didn't have any really exams in my area, I just called the AAPC and said, hey, I need a, an exam voucher for the CPB. So what that does is it just puts it in your account and then you have a year to schedule that. Um, not that you have to take it within a year, but you have a year to schedule it. So I have a, up until now December to find a location near me that's convenient whenever I'm ready to take that CPB exam. It just sits in my account, those two attempts. Sammy's asking, can you make a video on coding audiology? So I've actually not done a lot of audiology coding. Um, I could do something on it, but since I'm not super familiar, I've not personally done it myself, it would probably be lower on the list of things that I have to make videos about in the next you know, couple of months. Do I have any knowledge of uh, ambulance co coding process? Yeah, that's another one that I actually haven't done. I've not done any ambulance coding. Doris is saying, did you say you need op report samples? So yeah, um, I'm looking for some sample reports to use because I get a lot of requests for case studies. I just want to make sure that if I'm using any case studies that I have permission, for example, from the provider to use them, that the, the information from the patients have, has been properly omitted and that there's an understanding that it gets, goes on my YouTube channel potentially, which is monetized. And that's kind of where the barriers are that, you know, I want to make sure that the, all the, the, T's are crossed and I's are dotted so that it's not that just someone's forwarding the information that they don't really have the right to or that someone sent me something with patient information on it by accident. And now I have to, you know, report that out because <laughs> that's going to be a pain in the butt to have to you know, report out a HIPAA violation um, for, because someone just forwarded me something with patient information on it um, and that there's an understanding that it goes on my YouTube channel potentially and that YouTube channel does receive is monetized, so I do receive, you know, a small amount of money per thousand views. I know I saw something up here because I'm seeing some comments about um, becoming a coder later in life. Let's see if I can find the original comment in here. But I do want to mention to you, and I don't, I don't talk about this too, too much. But if you're, oh, here it is. Monica saying, I'm a late coder here, 44 year old woman finally decided to study medical coding. A massage therapist and former medical call center agent and people tell me you're going, to, I'm going to fail. And you say, no, you're not. And absolutely you should tell them no, you're not. So this is, this is funny. Um, my former mother-in-law, so I'm divorced and my, my ex-husband's mother is a certified coder. She got certified, I think, in her 50s. I, I, I don't know that she would admit to this, but she was kind of inspired by me and my success um, and decided she wanted to get into to something. She was working um, at a healthcare agency, but not really in that capacity. I think she was doing maybe charity organization or something like that within there um, and decided to get in medical coding. Uh, past her certification now, and she is like a medical records coordinator. She's out towards more towards Philadelphia area. But yeah, my former mother-in-law is uh, is a medical coder. I've asked Lizzie, my daughter, a couple of times if she wants to get into medical coding, like her her mom and her grandma. <laughs> she said no. Uh, but you, it honestly, I I don't think that doing it later in life is a barrier. And I would say that. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it really depends on you, on people too. My my sister went through the same program through Reading Community College I did, but kind of got off on a different track, had trouble finding a position, uh, in, is still not certified, you know, 
more than a decade later. So I think she's working as a technical partner. So uh, she works in the hospital. Paula's saying her other's a chiropractor. Could you use chiropractic reports? You could ask. That would be great. I would love if you asked and see if he could send me some reports. Just make sure, that all, like I said, all the patient information is taken out because I don't want to have to report out any kind of complications because of that. Um, funny story, actually, my, my boyfriend's sister is a podiatrist in the Lexington, Kentucky area. I've only met one of his family members. You know, it's, uh, they, they're all across the country and stuff. And so I've never met his sister, but she's a podiatrist in Lexington, Kentucky. And when she was setting up her, her practice some years ago, my boyfriend was, was helping her out at the practice, I guess, just kind of running the front desk, talking to the patients and so forth. And apparently at some point a patient had come in and requested their medical records. And my boyfriend, not knowing uh, much about, you know, privacy regulations and so forth, took the the paper file and just handed it to the patient and went, here you go, here's your medical records. <laughs> oh, that cracks me up every time thinking about it. And I guess uh, eventually the, the practice manager chased the patient down and, and got their only copy of their paper records, <laughs> paper records back. Chikina says she's 45. She just passed the CPC exam or passed the exam in December. So that's fantastic. Congratulations. Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely not something you have to be like fresh out of high school or college to do medical coding. It's, it's something that people of every age is, are getting into. I'm putting all the ICD-10 CM and CPT guidelines on a recorder to listen to during my night job. It makes the night go quickly and helps familiarize repetitively eight hours, five times a week. Hopefully it works. That's a great idea. So, um, oh, we have a new member. New member. Amber, welcome to, to new member. <laughs> I'm sorry, I love that SpongeBob dancing. I know I should put something more professional there. But I love dancing, SpongeBob. <laughs> Congrats on becoming a member of the channel. Hey, if you're interested in joining my YouTube channel, um, you don't have to, but you do have membership perks. There are custom emojis. You get community-only posts. Uh, I do have two CEU course offerings that are just for my paid members. And there are, um, at the gold and platinum level, you get your names added to the end credits of the videos. And platinum level, you get behind-the-scenes footage and additional information about um, stuff going on just behind the scenes and sometimes outtakes, which is great. This is a great question. Is it mandatory to have the CPCI credential if you wanna teach medical coding? I do have eight years of coding experience and multiple credentials. So actually no, anyone can teach medical coding. My neighbor can teach medical coding if he wants to. The problem is that what the CPCI credential or the, the coding credential does is it allows you to license the material. So if you are someone who wants to teach the CPC material um, and you're not a certified instructor, you can go ahead and teach coding, but you have to understand that you're going to have to create all of the materials from scratch. So all of the cases, all of the quizzes, all of the practice material, all the PowerPoints, all of the slides, you can't just take them from anywhere else. Um, you have to, you have to, would have to develop them yourself, or you can license them if you become a CPCI, CPC instructor, or if you want to go through maybe, um, I think it's the AM, no, it's Elsevier that publishes the step-by-step -step medical coding book. So you have to license that material and pay for those materials in order to utilize them. If you're not, if you're not licensed to use those materials and you don't have rights to use them, um, then that would be a copyright violation if you're just, you know, um, taking materials from someone else that they've developed and utilizing them to sell courses for yourself. So while, while you don't have, it's not mandatory that you have to be a, 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 a approved instructor through the AAPC to teach their curriculum. If you want to license any of those materials, you have to be. Otherwise, you have to develop everything from scratch. I personally think it's well worth the cost because I don't have the time to sit here and develop a test bank of 500 and plus coding questions. I don't have time to develop the slides. But if you're thinking about doing that, um, um, 
Yeah, those would be the two ways I would go. You, there's a couple of options. You could either make everything yourself or you can license through the AAPC or you could see about working with Elsevier for their step-by-step -step medical coding materials. Um, what do you think about taking the CPRC after taking the CPC six times not passing? I'm wondering if maybe you mean the CRC because the CPRC is the Certified Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery Coder, and that is one I have, but they haven't tested for in a while. It's a, a res retired credential. If you're looking at taking the CRC, the Certified Risk Adjustment Coder, I think that might be a good option. Uh, someone actually asked recently, are you allowed to take the CRC without the CPC? There's no order in which you have to take actually any of AAPC's credentials. So you don't have to get like a CPC before you get anything else. You can get the CRC, you can get the CPPM, you could get any credential through the AAPC first. You don't have to have the CPC first. CRC might be a good option then. I'm seeing yes, Ani. So yeah, so if you're looking at getting into something and you failed the CPC exam a bunch of times, you might want to just uh, nail down ICD-10 CM coding, and in which case the CRC might be a good example. After we take the CPC, do we have to take more exams and certificates? Is it mandatory? Uh, the only thing that's mandatory after you take the CPC exam is that you have to get your CEUs and you have to maintain your membership. Otherwise, if you don't do those two things, you can lose your CPC credential. So you have to get a certain amount of CEUs and they're typically submitted every other year. Uh, there's exceptions to that, like if you are prorated because you got on a corporate plan or the other option would, or the other thing that you have to do is pay for your membership. If you don't pay for your AAPC membership, you will lose your credentials. You have to be a member and have to get your CEUs to maintain, but you're not required to get any additional certifications if you don't want to. I know lots of medical coders that haven't. Um, can you make a separate video on e &M level picking? I actually have a handful. So if you go onto uh, my do I have a playlist for that? I don't know if I have an E&M playlist, but I do have a lot of E&M videos on my YouTube channel. So if you just go to the YouTube channel and scroll through the videos, I'll see if I can find it quick. But I know there's a handful on there that I did specifically on E&M leveling. Um, let's see if I can find it. But there is there is a lot of videos on the YouTube channel about E&M coding. Hello, Jackie Romero has become a paid channel member. <laughs> This, this is going to be a going thing when I get paid channel members and I do, I do the SpongeBob dance. So congratulations, Jackie. Thank you for joining the channel as a new member. Uh, I really want to take your CRC boot camp. Next one you're offering is too soon for me. Will you be offering another one in April or May? Yes, I will be offering ones in April or May. So this is the funny uh, side note. I'll tell you guys because we're getting close to time and I have to interview Tony in about half an hour. Um, with, now I totally forgot where I was going. Oh, so my office here is on the second floor of my house. And it's a tiny little third bedroom that I converted into an office. Across from me directly this way is a huge vacant field. And then I have neighbors that are on the left side of me and neighbors on the right side of me. So what happens is as we start getting into the spring and summer months, that's when I have to compete against my neighbors lawn mowing and chainsawing schedules. So uh, I don't know what the schedule is of when they mow this giant field that is literally across the street from my house. Um, so as we, that's what, that's my, my hang up is that now, as I know we're getting into the weekend, I'm going to have to compete with the boot camps of potentially lawn mowing noises going outside. Um, hopefully I think in the, usually in the mornings is when they don't do them, but, um, that might just be something we'll have to deal with that there may or may not have to maybe soundproof better. So you don't hear the buzzing of lawnmowers going on outside when we start hitting spring and summer boot camps. Days are usually not too bad if I do it something like on a Tuesday or Thursday, but I'm definitely open to feedback. If there is uh, a lot of interest in people who want to do boot camps on, you know, evenings on weekend, weekday evenings. I'm certainly, up, excuse me, certainly up for that as well. Where can I get practice filling out or filling, uh, filing CMS 1500 forms or UB04? I don't know if there's a lot of practice modules. Actually, I don't know if you guys know this. You can buy these forms on Amazon. So I actually have a stack that I just bought on Amazon of CMS 1500 forms that I use for various purposes when I'm making my videos. So you could possibly just buy them on Amazon and practice just filling out the forms yourself. I don't know that there's a lot of online modules that I'm aware of. 
question to uh, IT professionals ever cross over to medical coding for work-life balance or whatever. I know there's a crossover from accounting people all of the time. Accounting and nursing, I'm seeing a lot of crossover. I have started getting a lot of inquiries from people in the IT industry and they're like, oh, well, you know, I do um, JavaScript and it should be, you know, no problem for me to learn medical coding. And someone actually asked me recently, they're like, oh, well, a, a developer in California makes, you know, $150,000 a year. Why is medical coding uh, not pay as much? And I'm like, oh, well, I don't know if you know this, but medical coding isn't a programming language. It's not coding in the way that you code for an app or a program or something like that. It really is more of a translation props, process of uh, reviewing medical records, abstracting all of the diagnoses, procedures, and services, and translating them into codes. It's not necessarily like a programming language. So yeah, I'm starting to see interest from IT professionals, but I think some of them are uh, maybe taking a step back from their interest when they realize that um, some of the programming jobs are paid quite a bit more than medical coding jobs. Which certs are in high demand right now other than CRC? Um, I think the tops would be CPC and CPMA. There's a lot more auditing requests, I think, these days. And I think I think the CPMA, even if you're not don't, don't have auditing experience, is a great one to keep in your back pocket until you have more years of experience or until something opens up that maybe is more of a quality review type position and you have that credential. Is the CEMC valuable or just do the CRC? You already have your CPC. I, I think so. The most popular credential the AAPC has is their CPC. Second is the CRC. So those are the two highly requested ones. CEMC, I really can't speak for right now because I know we've had these ENM changes and I don't know exactly what that looks for. Um, I would say the CEMC is probably not as popular as having like a CPMA, like an auditing credential. This is going to be the last question I can kind of take sense, I take because I have I have to get off now and, and uh, get a drink and maybe some lunch before my next thing. For CPC ACE, do you recommend the practical through AAPC? Yes, absolutely. I think you really need to focus on getting that apprenticeship status removed so that you can be much more valuable to the market. Um, I think it's worth the value. I think it is very tough. I took, I, I, Practico didn't exist when I was a CPCA, but I did take one of their specialties, which kind of runs through the same program. Tough. First case I got, tough. Um, I think the, the rest of them, maybe not so much, but that first particular one I got was not something I'd coded in the past and was a little tough. So uh, Angela is saying you can print the PDF link uh, for the 1500 forms. So yeah, there are, I know sometimes in the chats, it won't show links because it, it omits them. Um, but if, you could probably search for them as well. So thank you everyone. I am so excited to have you guys here with me today. I'm probably going to take a look at my polls that I have on YouTube. Definitely check those because I'm taking some feedback right now. If Tuesdays at this time are good, or if you'd rather me move to like a Saturday, so you're not a lot of you probably at work right now. Uh, thank you everyone so much for joining me today. And most importantly, guys, you always know, just keep on coding on.